catechism recitation for this morning is commandment number five and commandment number six and their meanings. What is the fifth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we may not hurt nor harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. What is the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we may lead a chaste and decent life in word and deed, and each love and honor his spouse. Our opening hymn this morning, number four in the Lutheran hymnal, God Himself is Present.
Come, let us worship the Lord, the Holy Trinity. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. 
Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. The first reading for this morning continues our hearing of the great stories of the Bible, beginning with the book of Genesis. This morning we reach chapter 26, and a story that sounds vaguely familiar, as we see that it is certainly like father, like son, for as we saw how Abraham had pawned off his wife Sarah as his sister, in order to save his life. So we see the same of Isaac. But we also see here how God continues to bless the faithful <coughs> Isaac with forgiveness and life and the pledge that his family tree will be the one that bears the very Savior of the world, the Christ. From the book of Genesis, the 26th chapter. There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked about his wife. And he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, She is my wife, because he thought, Lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw. And there was Isaac, showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife. So how could you say, She is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then, Isaac sowed in that land, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks, and possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is off. 
So he called the name of the well Essek, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. this 10th Sunday after Holy Trinity is from St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians where he speaks about the individual members of the temple of God, the body of Christ, God's own holy church, to have been given diverse gifts in accord with the will of the Holy Spirit. And to each of us, he has so blessed us that we might work together to serve one another, to serve our neighbors, and to serve our God as his holy temple. From the first epistle to the Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, <coughs> distributing to each one individually, as he wills. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee, o Lord. The third reading is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter where we find Jesus weeping over the spiritual estate of the city of Jerusalem, his people, even as he comes now to visit them with his grace. They are ill-prepared because of their lack of faith. He then chases out the money changers in the temple to purge the temple as a sign and symbol of the work that he had come to do that in his death for us, he exorcises all demons that we might be a purified and holy temple for him. From the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. Now as Jesus drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, 
surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Number 234 from the Lutheran hymnal, Holy Ghost with Light Divine. Grace to you and peace from God, your Father, and his Son, your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father and the Son who send the Holy Spirit to call and gather us in the body of Christ that the Son might lead us to the Father and his love forever. Amen. Then the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. 
Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. God appoints the place where he wants Isaac to establish his dwelling. His dwelling. And his dwelling. The term tabernacle, the first temple appointed to be constructed by the children of Israel as God himself establishes it, designs it, tells them what materials to use and how to place it together, even to the very dimensions of this portable dwelling place is precisely that. The term tabernacle means to dwell. It's a place where God lives with his people in the place where he himself establishes this dwelling for himself and for his people. The theme of this particular Sunday in the church year, the 10th Sunday after Holy Trinity, is all about the temple, particularly as we commemorate in this month of August the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 AD by the army of the Roman Empire a temple that has not been rebuilt to this present day. And how Jesus had prophesied of its destruction because the people, his own people, did not believe. So God permitted the destruction of that temple and has caused the circumstances of human history to fall into place so that, indeed, not one of those ancient stones has been stacked upon another in that place. For God has a new temple in mind. Indeed, to focus on what that tent of animal skins, and even the later temple built in Jerusalem in the days of Solomon the king signified. They are all about the temple of the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit in which God continues to dwell even in the very temple of your own flesh. The temple, as it was appointed by God in the first tabernacle for the children of Israel during their time on the exodus from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan, even as we hear how God now has pledged to the descendants of Isaac, even as he had given that to Abraham and his descendants, these particular lands in which they would dwell and dwell with God. As God led them back to that place after the 430 year captivity in Egypt, beginning with the days of Isaac's son, Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel, this tent must be portable as God would lead them from dwelling place to dwelling place for those 40 years in that wilderness. But always then establishing that as the first structure to be erected when they reached a new campsite that they might be reminded that this is the dwelling place of God 
and therefore their dwelling place too, the place of God's faithful. That tabernacle was composed of three basic parts. The first part, the vestibule, is where the people were gathered as they came in from out of the world into this gathering place to which God, the Holy Spirit, had called them. Indeed, that entire space was to remind the people of God that indeed they are unworthy to enter into the presence of God except through the faith that God creates through the working of his word by his Holy Spirit who calls us by the gospel of forgiveness, enlightens our hearts and our minds to the reality that God by his grace for the sake of his Christ calls us his very children adopted by his grace. And we stand here in his presence solely on account of the work of the Holy Spirit through the word, that word attached to sacraments, the word proclaimed in the hearing of the people that invited them in to the very dwelling place of God. And then comes the holy place. The holy place that is the symbol of Christ, the Son of God. That tabernacle being made of animal skins as a reminder that as God had prophesied that he would send his own seed who would be human, yes, but divine also in one human body, God enfleshed in the body of man so that God himself in Christ might bear the sins of the world, might sacrifice himself unto death to be the death for all sin. And the Holy Spirit leads us into that confession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord, a name for God that means our Redeemer, who has purchased and won us back from sin and death and hell, not with money, as the money changers and those who did business in the temple would later focus upon, but rather with his own innocent suffering, his precious blood, his priceless death. And so the Spirit leads us into a relationship with Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, as our Savior. And then from the holy place, the place in which the word of Christ and the sacraments of Christ were administered by his ministers, his priests in the tabernacle, that Christ leads us to the holy of holies, the most holy place, God the Father himself. Even as Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes unto the Father except through me. And so it's necessary not only to hear the calling of the Holy Spirit and to establish a relationship with Jesus Christ, his, the Son of God, but to know that it's through faith in Jesus alone that we are led to the very heart of God. But then, there we dwell with God our Father, 
with Jesus Christ, our brother, with the Spirit who continues to sanctify us by his grace through the ongoing power of the word and the sacraments that builds up and strengthens our faith, that leads us to stand in this faith in God and dwell with him. And then, as we emerge from this holy of holy places, which can only be accessed with the blood of the Lamb of God, even as it was in the Old Testament when the Holy of Holies was only entered once a year on the Day of Atonement, with the priest bringing the blood of the sacrificial lamb into that most holy place, because without the shedding of innocent blood, there is no forgiveness. The shedding of the innocent blood of the Son of God, who is appointed to be that once for all sacrifice to which all the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed. That same blood has atoned for our sins. And we enter into God's temple, into the very heart of God through that same blood of Jesus Christ, and then emerge together as the body of Christ, as his temple, together with the individual members of that as we are, as St. Paul encourages us to see how each of us, every single Christian, has been given a particular gift that can be used in service to God by being put into work in the world for our neighbors, within our households, as in cooking, cleaning, fixing things out into service in the workplace, creative things, hard labor things, and everything in between. And all of these gifts given by the Holy Spirit so that we might serve our neighbors in love through these gifts, so that we might also understand our callings by this Holy Spirit that we might know what our tasks of service are and, and focus upon them so that we are working in accord with that which God has equipped us to do and lead this joyful and blessed life of love to which God himself has called us, the God who is love who sends us out of the holy of holies today, for we have entered in here to hear his word of forgiveness, of salvation, of renewed life, that we enter, we exit as holy temples to live the example of Jesus Christ as the living embodiment of God. For God dwells within each and every one of you by virtue of your hearing of this word, your receiving of this truth by that gracious work of the Holy Spirit. And now we turn ourselves inside out and go out into the world bearing witness to this God, including where we are able, by our words and by our deeds of love, showing the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work within us, that we bear witness to the hope that is within us, the hope for this never-ending relationship with God that God would gift to all who believe. And so the Holy Spirit begins his work anew through you living temples, living in the world, calling men and women and children again into his holy temple to a relationship with his son who leads us to the very heart of God. Even so now, 
the Spirit is unleashed among us as we hear this word that declares not only the forgiveness of all of our sins, but also the power to live this life anew, not under the threat of compulsion that the law of God against the sinner declares, but in love for this God who has done such amazing things and continues to dwell among us with and within each of us and continuing to lead us to the heavenly vestibule where even now all the souls of those who walked this life of faith now await the entrance into the holy place waiting for us on the last day when all will enter into that final and fully consummate relationship with Christ Jesus, our Savior, who will then lead us to see and behold the mystery of God our Father and Him and the Holy Spirit with whom we will dwell forevermore. Amen peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together in the morning canticle for Matins, the Benedictus.
Sunday service, we stand for this first portion and begin with the chanting of the Kyrie. Continue your mighty work 
in the world as the Lord of all nations to enter into all the nations and work your might in showing mercy upon us all. And in your pity, put an end to our pettiness, our hatred, all violence, all war, and bring a harmony, a unity, and a peace throughout the world, especially as we approach six months of war in the Ukraine. We pray for a speedy and complete truce and end to the bloodshed and devastation there. Bless all the refugees, especially for Natalia and Emma, and see fit to open up the doors so that they might find new homelands where there is indeed peace and safety. Especially we would pray for Natalia and Emily that they might come to this land of peace. We ask that you would continue to comfort and console all those who grieve and mourn over the passing of loved ones with that peace that you alone can give through your word and your spirit. We ask that you would continue to work mightily, your healing touch upon us all, so that we might be strengthened day by day that you would work through the medications and the care that we take of our own bodies to continue to make us as healthy as possible, to continue to meet the challenges of each day. And for those in more, more acute need of your blessing, we pray on this day, especially for Kevin, for Karen, for Kathy, for Darlene, for our sister in Christ, Carol Koval from Ironwood, undergoing surgery tomorrow to remove a cancerous tumor. We also pray for those battling cancers, particularly Dan and Judy. Remember all those afflicted with chronic conditions that also rob them of their memory and the full functioning of our minds. And remember Hunter's and Reagan's other grandmother, Jane, in this wise and her dear husband, Randy. We also pray your continuing blessing upon Chris, Irene, Jerry, Diane, Melanie, Kenethia, and all those who remain in our hearts and our prayers to you. Remember in your mercies all expectant mothers and the little babes growing inside their bodies to keep safe mothers Crystal and Haley and Kimberly and their little ones throughout the remaining time of pregnancy and through childbirth as well. Continue to provide us with that kind of weather that allows us to enjoy the beauties of your creation in the outdoors. Continue to provide warmth and coolness, sunshine and rain in due measure so that we might bring in the remaining fruits of the harvest and count ourselves blessed indeed by your goodness. Go with us wherever our life journeys might take us, whether near or far this week, and keep us safe every step of the way, and make all of our business productive and our homecomings very joyful indeed. For these and all other things you see that we need, we pray, trusting in your providential care through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Beseech the Almighty God unto thy church, thy Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which cometh down from above, that thy word, as becometh it, may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve thee, and in the confession of thy name abide unto the end, through Jesus Christ our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end.
Sixty-six in the Lutheran hymnal, Christ, thou art the sure foundation. 